Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the um, University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about cl uh, climate system changes, um, most specifically with what uh, greenhouse gases are doing and how it's affecting the temperature distribution, um, mostly in the northern hemisphere. Um, this video um, will be used in my course. Uh, lecture tomorrow morning. My, I have lectures at 8.30 to uh, 10 one day and 10 to 11.30 another day and I'm certainly not a morning person so I thought I'd do some videos and uh, other people not in the course can see them, anybody on the web can see them and uh, you know if I feel really tired in the morning I can drink a coffee for 15 minutes while my video plays. Um, the data and plots that I'm showing are by my colleague Peter Carter in the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, AMEG, of which we've both been members for, I don't know, our group's been going about five years, I suppose. Um, so a big uh, thank you to uh, Peter Carter. So I'm just gonna hit the lights because the contrast is better. Okay, so um, let's get going here. Okay, so in the Arctic, um, there's multiple um, amplifying feedback loops. So we have our greenhouse gas emissions. We're putting CO2, methane, N2O, which is nitrous oxide, into the atmosphere, changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. That's also changing the chemistry of the oceans as the CO2 goes into the oceans. It causes the oceans to acidify. Also on top of the, uh, you know, the oceans are also warming and becoming more stratified, which causes deoxygenation and also reduces uh, phytoplankton in the surface layer because there's less mixing and you need the nutrients coming up from below with the vertical mixing um, to get phytoplankton growth. So these gases by radiative forcing are causing heating in the lower atmosphere. The surface is warming. Um, and then in the Arctic, we can get more greenhouse gases, we can get feedbacks. Um, for example, there's, there's twice as much atmospheric carbon in wetland, wetlands, permafrost, and the um, ocean floor sediments. So if these start coming up, which the, the rate that they're coming up at is actually increasing, if they come up ever faster, then they feed back in and cause an overall warming here. Um, the Arctic is also warming because where um, we're basically there's a declining spring snow cover and summer sea ice. So the albedo is reducing. Um, so there's more absorption um, of solar radiation. It's causing heating of the Arctic. So there's Arctic amplification, Arctic warming much faster than the global average or and even faster than the equator temperatures. So you get this feedback in this cycle here, which then reinforces this Arctic, Arctic feedback, which then reinforces the global climate uh, feedbacks. And of course, the impacts are becoming significant and enormous on a global basis. So this just is a, um, another view of the feedbacks uh, with the global surface warming, snow, uh, snow and ice in the Arctic declining, Arctic warming feeding back, and why is the Arctic warming or what are the effects? Well, we get these hydrates in the sediments coming up. We get the permafrost, the terrestrial permafrost, also the permafrost on the seafloor sediments. Um, Arctic wetlands are created and then they emit greenhouse gases because as the permafrost is thawing. Um, and also we're getting declines of uh, boreal forests um, up there um, and from, from diseases and fires and so on. So you get these, huge increases in atmospheric methane, for example, and methane is scavenged in the atmosphere by OH, which is hydroxide. Um, so the more methane there is, the less OH there is, um, and this that removes the, CO, the, the methane. So the methane lifetime actually has a latitudinal dependence and it lasts longer where there's less water vapor and therefore less OH. And this happens, you know, this is happening in the Arctic specifically. So so while the methane stays in the Arctic, um, it lives for longer, much longer than the, the 10, 11, 12 years, um, unless it dissipates um, south, unless it spreads south. 
So these are some recent atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations um, and the associated temperature increase. So this is a CO2 rise um, and uh, this is a CO2 rise over time. Um, this is uh, 2002 to present for each of these graphs. So the CO2 is rising up over 400 ppm, methane 1855 ppm, nitrous oxide th almost 330. And what you can see is that um, pre-1750, CO2 was set 280, and it varied in a range of 180 to, to roughly two, 180 to 280 or 300 over 800,000 years. Methane had a max of about 800 parts per billion, um, was 722 in, in, uh, okay, so how do I go back? Just one second, please. Do, 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 where are we? Here we go. Uh, slideshow from current slide. Okay, I gotta remember not to touch the screen. Um, so methane varied from 350 to about 700 and so odd. 800 maximum PP, PPB over 800,000 years. And of course it's way, way higher now. Um, and nitrous oxide varied between two, seven, you know, about, about uh, it was a maximum of about 300. I think it varied from 200 to 300 or something and it's pushing 330 now. So these are all very powerful greenhouse gases. So this is what the global, the climate has done, the warming from 2000, the global mean um, temperature um, and we're, we've shot up here. Um, so the global mean surface temperature increase to the end of 2015 relative to the 1880 to 1920 average is plus 1.13 degrees Celsius. Um, and in the Arctic, um, this is Northern Hemisphere rise, this is Arctic rise. Um, the Arctic rise is much, much stronger than um, any other rise, okay? This is the Arctic temperature amplification that's occurring. Um, and according to the latest research, there's only a temperature to emissions lag of about 10 years. People talk about 30 years all the time, but the latest research just out in March of this year shows that it could be as low as, as 10 years. Okay, so the IPCC is saying, yes, sea ice is gonna go. These are their numbers. Um, they're saying that these are the different emissions, uh, representative concentration pathways, lowest to the highest. Um, and they say a nearly free, ice-free Arctic Ocean in September is likely before mid-century under the worst case scenario. Um, and even under the best case scenario, the decline is projected to be 70%. Now, if you look at the data, if you look at the data, that's so the observations is declining much more quickly than that. And in fact, um, there is a likelihood or possi strong possibility that it could be gone by 2020 um, or, or, uh, or, or, or earlier. Um, anyway, it's, it's going. It's just a matter of, you know, when is it going? And when it does go, what will be the effects? And the effects will be enormous on society. Um, so this is the uh, Northern Hemisphere sea ice extent. Um, and uh, this is showing what it is doing in June, okay, uh, from 1980 to 2015, and it's declining. Uh, 1.5 million square kilometers, roughly, is the slope. Um, and this is what we have for the Northern Hemisphere snow cover, 6 million uh, square kilometers decline is a slope. So the actual Northern Hemisphere snow cover in June is dropping extremely fast, um, but other months it's not dropping as fast. But the, the, everybody talks about the sea ice decline, almost nobody talks about the snow cover decline, and the snow cover is actually declining faster. So the Arctic darkening from the snow cover decline is actually larger than that from the sea ice decline. Um, the NOAA put out an Arctic report card in December of last year have a look at it. Um, this is one of the figures from it. It's showing the difference from the average temperature in degrees Celsius. And it's showing you know, vast parts of the Arctic have warmed. You know, um, this is, uh, looks like two and a half to three degrees, the lighter brown two to two and a half degrees. 
this area here, um, this is all the, the lighter brown, I guess, this area here, you know, this is above one degree, this, this whole vast region. And you can see the global temperature average and the Arctic above 60 degrees. And you can see that the, the rise is much faster in the Arctic. This is from the NOAA report. Have a look at it, it's very good. Um, this is what, again, what we mean by temperature amplification or Arctic amplification. This is the global temperature rise. This is the Arctic temperature rise. The Arctic is much, is, is much uh, sharper rise. Um, this is showing the, the mean, uh, the global surface temperature increase um, 20, up to, this is data, this was generated December 21st. This is the data, you can see the very sharp rise um, this year and the El Nino is contributing a lot to that. The El Nino will be very strong um, going well into 2016, probably at least for the first four months, maybe even six months of 2016. So 2016 is very likely to be a much warmer year even than 2015, at least the first half of the year. Um, this is putting it into a longer term context, if you like. Um, so this is uh, from, you know, this is 60 million to years before present to, to zero. It was much warmer at periods in the past. 50 million years, the paleo eocene thermal maximum. Um, and um, this is uh, in the last 5 million years. So if you trace back the 1 degree level and the 2 degree level, we were last at 2 degrees above uh, pre-industrial 3.5 million years ago. We were above 1 degree 3 million years ago. Um, so we're in a regime now, um, our burning of fossil fuels has pushed up into a temperature re regime which the planet has not seen for millions of years. Um, now the distribution of CO2 and methane does vary with latitude. Um, so this is uh, very recent data. Um, the CO2 level so this is this is a sign of the latitude. So this is the south. This is the uh, south pole. This is the north pole. Um, this is the uh, equator, and you can see the rise. This is the CO2 distribution at, with latitude, and you can see it's rising up towards the Arctic, um, and also with methane, sharply higher in the Arctic, where the sources are becoming stronger and stronger. Um, the circles are the um, average monthly values, and these are pulses, the, the pluses are pulses that are influenced by local sources and th sinks. And this is, these are, this is not anomalous data. We're getting, large, we're getting pulses of methane coming out that, and pulses of CO2 coming out in the Arctic regions um, that are bringing these gases much higher. So this is all, obviously another uh, strong feedback in the Arctic. You know, if the greenhouse gases are much higher in the Arctic, then this will lead to much higher warming in the Ar Arctic. Um, so winter of 2015, um, highly aberrant temperatures. So this is November. So November, if you look, if you base November 2015, uh, we were 1.05 degrees Celsius above the 51, 1951 to 1980 average. If you go, um, uh, and uh, so this is a view of the planet, you know, look at the warming in Siberia, the El Nino is going on here. This is a top-down view, Greenland, North America, Asia, and the Arctic Ocean. You can see the warming is enormous here, um, averaged over November. And you can see the, the South Pole, the North Pole, the warming here, 5 degrees versus the equator, 1 degree. Like, we're just getting incredible warming. Um, so the heat balance is just thrown off. You can see the warming here is even higher, much higher in Antarctica than it is at the equator. Um, and it dips down, it's mostly just ocean there. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'll call this uh, part one um, of this uh, presentation um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll create another video with part two uh, momentarily. So thank you.